Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Peter Friesen. I'm the Director of Education at the historic St. Mary's City. Uh, but you might have noticed we're not at historic St. Mary's City. We're at our good friends and neighbors at St. Mary's College of America, who graciously uh, let us use their facility tonight for this evening. Uh, and also want to go ahead and thank our, the historic St. Mary's City Foundation, which is our friends group that helps support many of our programming, both research and education. And so they help provide funding to provide uh, this lecture free to the public as well. So I just want to make sure we thank those, those people. Um, and before I introduce our guest speaker, uh, if you haven't heard, we, we, Saturdays uh, we have a big event called uh, Militia Muster and Riverfest, but unfortunately with the ending storm, we had to cancel the Militia Muster. There'll be some aspects of Riverfest happening, but it's, it's, it's going to be much toned down because we're expecting maybe one to three inches and 20 mile per hour winds up to 50 mile an hour winds. So it doesn't sound like it's going to be a wonderful big thing. Uh, so sorry about that. But uh, at the end of the month, we will be hosting Blessing of the Fleet for the first time on the 30th uh, because uh, the South District Optimist Club typically has it up near St. Clemens Island, but they are having an exciting project of building a new. Uh, exhibit hall and so it's unable to have host this, the, the event there so we uh welcome the seventh edition optimist club to to have blessing hopefully here and it looks like there's gonna be a lot of exciting activities there will be water taxi for anybody who happens to visit by boat uh, there'll be fireworks at the end of the night uh so that'll be fun and then of course later on in october we have uh some of our more exciting uh, one of our favorite events at least in the education department and I think some of the people in the research department also like to participate. All right, I got a positive advance for one person for Lost City, which is our uh, free and pay what you can event where we dress up the town and the little spooky decor. The ship becomes a ghost pirate ship. And it's really fun for, for families and everybody to come to your And it's really good for your parents, grandparents. If you spend a lot of money on the costume, you can get multiple uses out of it as opposed to just the one bottle of weed. So that's a really bonus. For, for the lost city. Um, after that, uh, we'll get into our last program of the year, which is Hearth and Home, always after Thanksgiving. Um, that's always exciting and will be closed for the winter time. Um, so thank you for coming out. And without further ado, we'll go ahead and introduce our speaker. Who used to work here? Sarah Rivers Cofield has been the curator of federal collections at the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Laboratory in Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum since 2004. That's in Calvert County, in case anybody didn't know. She holds a BA in history from Murray State University and a Master of Applied Anthropology from the University of Maryland. She has seven years of experience in pre-contact and historic archaeological fieldwork and lab processing stemming from projects in Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, Tennessee, Jamaica, and Belgium. Since 2002, Sarah has focused on curation, collections management, and material culture research. Her past positions include adjunct faculty, at St. Mary's College of Maryland, Curation and Conservation Assistant at Historic St. Mary's City, Research Assistant at Monocacy National Battlefield, and Archaeological Aid for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission of Prince George's County. Her specialty is the study of small finds, especially metal artifacts. In 2019, Sarah received a grant from the Conservation Fund to study equestrian artifacts of the Colonial Chesapeake, so we know where this presentation originated. And so without further ado, Sarah, please. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Um, this is very exciting for me because HSMC is one of my research partners as part of the grant that I did. And like Peter said, I used to work here. So uh, I currently work at the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Laboratory. As he said, we call it the Mac Lab for short. Uh, we're the primary repository in Maryland for archaeological artifacts generated by laws. If, if a road is going in or a school is being built, the compliance archaeology that's being done usually comes to us. Obviously, places like St. Mary's keep their own collections, but we have stuff from throughout the state from various projects. Um, and I take care of the federally owned collections. Um, but before that, I worked here, and I went through lots of collections. St. John's, Van Swergen, Town Center. I was talking to the staff about it today. Um, and I did a conservation survey looking primarily at metal artifacts. And, and ever since then, I've had a love for metal artifacts. So I, I give this place a lot of credit. 
Um, because I don't only like to take care of the collections, I like to do research on them too, to show what they can do. There's a reason we keep all of this stuff. Um, and it's my favorite thing in the world to show people the potential of those artifacts uh, for research. So, um, one of the things that I learned when I got to the Mac Lab after I'd sort of settled into my job and figured out what I was supposed to be doing a few years into it, I was like, I can do research on collections now. Um, and we have this great website called Diagnostic Artifacts in Maryland that a lot of people use to identify things. Um, and when I first got there in 2004, they only had uh, colonial ceramics and pre-contact ceramics on this website. And since then, we've grown it a lot. And I've been adding the metal artifacts that I'm really into. Um, as I got into this research, one of the things I discovered is that these metal artifacts that I was interested in researching so many of them turned out to be horse related that even though I am not an equestrian horse person, I had to learn all about 17th and 18th century horses and the anatomy of all of that horse furniture, what they would have called it, or saddles and furniture, they call it in the, in the records, because a lot of little metal things go into one suite of horse furniture. But of course, archeologically, when those things end up in the ground, all of the organics go away, all the little metal things end up out of context, and we're not necessarily recognizing them as archeologists, especially since a lot of archeologists don't have any experience with horses or horsemanship. And I would have say the number of archeologists who have also built a saddle is probably pretty minuscule. <laughs> um, so the first category I added to the website was the little bridal ornaments that, that decorate bridles that we'll see in a little bit. And as I was doing research on those things, it became very clear that that I, I would see all of these other horse-related artifacts in the documents and be like, oh, hey, I've seen that. Oh, I know, I've seen that too. And so it really wasn't possible to just do one category of artifact because we're, when you look at the whole suite of horse furniture, there's all these different pieces that go into that. So the first ones I added to the website were the leather, the leather ornaments or bridal ornaments, cheek bosses, which go on the curb bits, spurs, and stirrups. And then I had to mass all of this other info on other artifacts as well. So four years ago, I applied for a research grant from the Conservation Fund to also add um, saddle parts. Let me scroll down a little bit. Uh, saddle parts, horse artifacts of horse care, horseshoes, um, and uh, bits. Bits are very important and very uh, complex. So I hadn't tried to tackle those yet. So I got this grant in, I don't know, late 2019 and of course early 2020 when I went to start working on the grant, the pandemic hit. So what was supposed to be a two-year grant turned into a four-year grant because part of this grant was to do research visits and I, we couldn't do that. We were all closed. Uh, so once everything opened back up, I had had a lot of time at home to do a lot of background reading, which was great. Um, but after the pandemic ended, I was able to go to do my partner visits to St. Mary City. I came here first, then to Jamestown, uh, the James Fort part of Jamestown, Jamestown Rediscovery, uh, Colonial Williamsburg, and the Department of Historic Resources in Virginia. And the reason I chose those sites is because at the Mac Lab, the very earliest site that we have uh, dates to 1637. So it's pretty early. It's down in St. Inigo's. It's associated with the Jesuits, the same kind of people who were interacting up here at St. Mary City. But there's not a whole lot from that site. And I wanted to get earlier. So I have everything from the mid 17th century to throughout the rest of the colonial period. But in order to understand what was going on in the first half of the 17th century, I had to come here and go to Jamestown and go to Williamsburg, which has Martin's 100, um, and DHR, which has a lot of sites from the 1620s and 30s. So I was trying to get back to these earlier collections and also a wider geographic region. So as part of this research, um, down here, this is sort of my, my visual representation of the research. So the, this is my goal as an archeologist. I wanna be able to interpret artifacts in context to better understand all of our sites and colonial life here. That's my goal. But in order to be able to do that, I had to understand how horses were being used in England when the English colonies came around. How was all of this horse-related furniture manufactured and traded? 
How did the horses come to the tobacco colonies and how were people using them once they were here? Um, and those things are all very much historical research, looking at primary historic documents, secondary uh, literature, anything I can find. Then there's this material culture piece, which is recognizing the artifacts when we find them, which can be a lot harder than it seems. Um, a saddle, once it's in pieces, doesn't look like a saddle anymore. Um, so I had to do all four of those things before I can get at this one thing that is my goal. So we're gonna sort of follow those different components and you'll see the little circle at the top to know where we're at in the research um, as I go through how this all went. So first element is how horses were used in England. Um, there are two different sort of kinds of uses of horses that I had to cover. One is saddle horses and the other is harness horses. So saddle horses in England in the 17th century were being used for warfare, racing, uh, which was becoming increasingly popular at that time, travel and exercise, of course, um, and hunting. Um, and the nature of hunting in England was very much in in flux at the time because their environment was changing. Instead of sort of medieval stag hunts through open forests, they were switching more to fox hunts in fields that had been cleared. So things were in flux there when, when the colonies started. Um, harness horses, uh, archeologists almost always call these, really, these artifacts harness artifacts. And um, in the horse world, that's not true. So in the horse world, when you have harness, you have attached your horse to a vehicle, to something that it's pulling. And the vast majority of horses we have in Colonial Maryland and Virginia are saddle horses. So they're not technically harness horses. Um, but in 17th century England, you did have harness horses for pulling coaches, carriages, wagons, cargoes, things like that all over. They had roadways. Um, they were using vehicles. Um, one of the things about England, though, at the time, and part of the reason that we had all of these, Im, you know, colonial immigration efforts, is that there was a uh, population pressure. Uh, land wasn't available to everybody. It was relatively expensive, and therefore having a horse was also relatively expensive. So when you lived in England, you had to not only buy the horse and the horse tack, but you also had to feed it. The environment wasn't sort of a year-round feed kind of situation. So you had to be prepped for the winter. Uh, you had to do farrier services, horseshoes and everything for the roadways, and, and farriers were also the sort of the vets of the time period, um, and stabling and pasturing. Um, so you ended up with a relatively expensive ownership formula there. And that meant that only the nobility and the wealthiest classes could have specialized horses for riding, hunting, racing, pulling their coach, etc. cetera. Um, whereas sort of the wealthier, like upper classes might have some specialization work horses versus saddle horses. Um, the lower classes maybe would have a single all-purpose horse that was cared for by the family as opposed to staff to do it. And, but the vast majority of people just had no horse at all. <clears throat> all right, so that's what's going on in England. Now we're gonna talk about how everything came over here. So the introduction of horses to North America is, is a very interesting and, and complex and sort of deep history kind of thing. Um, but basically the Spanish came when they were, the conquistadors were coming over, they brought their horses and they were using them to intimidate people and, and horses were definitely a thing. That was not the case for the English colonies. Um, it's really hard to get a horse on a tall ship for one thing. You can see over here, it's like in a sling. They, they have to be able to stand up. It wasn't really great conditions for them. You have to have all of the, the feed and everything to take care of the horse, like as part of the cargo, it takes up a, a lot of space to bring a horse. So the Spanish did it. When the English came, um, the Spanish horses had not spread all over the continent. So there weren't horses yet in Maryland and Virginia, even though there were horses already in like Florida and some of the other Spanish colonial areas. Um, so what happened is the English introduced the horses to the British colonies, but much later, and the two cultures didn't really come together. Spanish horse furniture is very different in flavor than English horse furniture. Um, it was very much influenced by uh, sort of the, the Spanish North Africa wars that were going on and all of the intermixing of those cultures. And so it has a very much like an Islamic kind of Muslim flavor to it. 
Um, and that is what eventually turned into Western writing culture. So you think California, Mexico, Southwest, et cetera, Western writing is what evolved from Spanish traditions, whereas the English writing traditions just stayed the English writing traditions. They really didn't like mix up, mash up at all in the colonial period. Um, the first horses that came over, as far as I know from the documentation, came to Jamestown in 1609. Seven horses were reported having arrived there. Um, the colonists ate them within months because they were starving. Uh, so the population went from zero to seven and then to zero again. Um, the, the settlement pattern that was developing in the Jamestown colony um, around Virginia and places like Martin's Hundred and things like that, horses weren't super practical. It wasn't the number one thing they were, they were demanding um, from the folks back overseas because tobacco growth didn't really require plowing. People were felling trees. Um, they were girdling the trees. They were sort of doing hand agriculture around stumps, both for the corn, the beans, the tobacco, all of that. Um, it wasn't practical to pull a plow through, through freshly uh, cleared forests. Travel by water was the most common, and it was also safer because at the time in Virginia, there were still a lot of hostile indigenous groups who were sort of like, we don't want you here. And so sometimes relations were good and sometimes not so much. So you couldn't just wander in the woods uh, with, and stay safe. Um, and so for the most part, people stayed within these, within walking distance of some kind of palisaded fort. So having a horse was not super practical at the time. Um, they did get some more horses in the 16 teens, but in 1622, there was a huge conflict um, between the indigenous population in Virginia and the colonists again. Um, and a lot of people were, were killed and then they were starving because largely the starvation was because when relations were bad with the Indians, they couldn't trade for corn and they couldn't grow enough of it themselves and they were hiding in their forts so they couldn't grow it either. Um, and so it happened again in 1622. So all the horses they had by then, again, they had to eat them. So by 1624, we were down to like one horse in Virginia. So let's move on to Maryland. Uh, when Maryland was founded, and I'm going to assume since this is a St. Mary's audience, most of you know about the founding of Maryland and the Calverts and Andrew White and all of those folks, the Ark and the Dove and all that. Um, so when they came over, one of the things that Andrew White noted was that you could get pigs and cows and goats in Virginia, but you could not get horses. Uh, they, they, they were not there to be had. Um, and that's because even by 1650, there were only maybe 300 horses in, in the total Maryland and Virginia colonies. That was only 1% of the population. Even though they had had some population growth spurts, the horses were not necessarily part of that population. So the first uh, record we have of horses in Maryland are those in Leonard Calvert's probate inventory. He was the first governor. Um, and he died in 1647. Um, and in his probate inventory, he had three stone horses, three mares, one stone coal, worth 8,400 pounds of tobacco, which was more than twice as much as that lovely country's house you all might be familiar with, with its 100 acres of townland, which was only 4,000 pounds of tobacco. Um, and then his three manors at Piney Neck and a large house, and, and manors are like, I don't even know how many acres, but it's thousands, like a lot, right? <laughs> anyway, um, that was only 7,000 pounds of tobacco. So these horses were extremely valuable. Um, and if you're not familiar with the terms, the stone horses refer to not geldings, as in male horses that could still sire new horses. Um, and so he clearly, this was his breeding stock he must have brought over, three stallions and three mares. This was like 34% of his entire estate and a bunch of people started fighting over the horses and who had the right to them after he died. And some of those records are pretty interesting. So, um, it's really not until the 1660s and 70s that things are getting settled. We're getting after the English Civil War era. We're getting into a time period when the English Navigation Acts have kicked in, and we're getting more English trade and less like Dutch and smuggling and things like that. Politics have calmed down a little bit. Um, the restoration of Charles II has happened. Um, 
the populations are going up and there's more stability and security in these English colonies. And so we have this settlement pattern settling in. People are forming plantations along waterways. Uh, they need a lot of land, so they're fairly spread out. They tend to take that massive amount of land that they have and separate it into like a third meadow, a third forest, a third for their crops, thereabouts. Um, and so as people are settling into this pattern, it's a little bit easier to introduce horses into this. Um, and as they're settling into this pattern as well, they're further away from each other. So in order to visit, they might want more ways than waterways. There might not be a security risk to traveling through the woods on your horse anymore. Um, so horses become part of the culture in this time period. Some of the great things about being in the Chesapeake as opposed to being in England is that yes, you have the purchase price of the horse and yes, you have to get a saddle and all of the tack, but they only gave them a little bit of corn and feed, and then they just kind of let them wander around in the woods. Um, so for those of you who live in this area, you know the vegetation is extremely active most of the time. Like you can't keep the roots and everything out of the way, the vines or whatever. So all of those areas of woods, um, meadows, they would just kind of let the livestock roam, including the horses. Also, we have nice, wonderful clay, soft soils, and so people didn't have to shoe their horses just didn't have to play, pay a farrier here. You just kind of would file the hoof down and maintain it and you're good. Um, the, the climate isn't as cold, uh, it's a little bit more temperate, so they didn't bother to build stables. If they really needed a stable, most of the time you would just use your tobacco house or whatever if it was a bad storm or something and you wanted to stick your livestock in there. That's not to say there weren't any stables, there were. Um, but as part of this research, one of the exciting things is being like, oh, there was a stable here. That means something special was going on. Um, and we have a stable at Jefferson Patterson Park where I work, and I'm pretty sure that the people there were involved in sort of training and breeding. Um, and there was a very early stable at the, at the country's house here in St. Mary's, which makes sense because it was one of the main first gathering places. Um, yeah, so the expense of owning a horse here versus in England was like nothing. Um, also, the woods were sort of, they, they were old growth, so they were nice, wide, and open, and people could just use deer trails. So even though there weren't really a lot of roads and you couldn't pull vehicles, you could easily travel on a saddle horse through the woods. Um, and so that's what a lot of people did, especially once we had county seats and towns and things like that. They would travel through the woods to go to those events. Um, so by the time we get to 1680, pretty much everybody had a horse. I mean, not everybody, everybody, but all of the, all of the travelers accounts, all the people who visited here, all of them refer to how it's really rare to see anybody walking. Um, you know, everybody traveled on horseback. Um, and when I say everybody, that does include the enslaved population. So one of the big questions I had in my research is where you have a larger enslaved population, will you also have more horse tack or were they not riding? Um, and it turns out from the research that they were riding because um, the, the sort of culture that developed here was that everybody would travel on their horses very fast. They called it a planter's pace. Um, and so people would just like gallop to wherever they were going and kind of give their horse a little bit of corn, slap it on the butt and be like, go, go to the woods. So they were not taking great care of their horses at all. Um, but because they're going super fast wherever they're going, if they want their servant to come with them, and usually they would have some kind of attendant coming with them, they had to be on horseback too. You can just have them like walking behind or leading the horse or whatever. Um, and so I, I don't have any good early images, but I have some really nice 19th century images that show where you have somebody on horseback with their groom also on horseback. And, um, and you do see in probate inventories that are sort of broken out by in this main house versus this quarter versus whatever, you'll see with the enslaved population that they might have one or two horses at their um, quarters. And they would use those to travel around within the plantation as well. Um, but when I say that everyone rode, it didn't apply to the indigenous populations. 
Um, and in fact, there's a lot of, <laughs> there are several fun quotes uh, about the indigenous populations making fun of the Europeans, saying two legs are too many for such lazy people as can't visit their closest neighbor without six. <laughs> so like, you, it, like, you guys are so lazy, you can't just like walk next door, you have to like get on horseback. But it became such a part of the culture that it was so weird to not be seen on your horse that everybody had to go on horseback. And there are some other great travelers accounts where they sort of make fun of people for walking three miles into the woods to find their horse so they could ride one mile to, to wherever they were going. Um, and, and while I agree that that probably was true, I also think that most of the people who are doing that were probably sending one of their servants, indentured or enslaved people, like out into the woods to get that horse and not doing it themselves. But that's just a theory. Anyway, so what was happening? Everybody's coming with their horses. In a place like St. Mary City, where people are coming for court, for business, um, to, to see other people, because the court was the big entertainment, um, you know, such and such is suing such and such for slander, and I really want to watch, you know, um, everybody would come. And this is where most of the ordinaries or inns were for people to stay, and everybody's on horseback. And so very early, spontaneous horse races started to happen because everybody has their saddle horse and they just start like competing. And this is the origin of the quarter horse. It's a quarter mile within a town where people would watch these races in, in Virginia and Maryland. It was happening in both places. I think we have uh, accounts of races as early as the 1670s in Charles County. I don't know of any super early ones in St. Mary's, but I would say that you guys probably certainly would have had a traditional racetrack here, even if it wasn't a specifically formal one. So the races are popping up. Um, and so when people are coming, that was part of the normal entertainment. Yes, you go to court. Yes, you go to the ordinary. Yes, you drink a lot and you hang out with your friends. Um, but you also would watch people race their horses. So uh, one of my favorite quotes about this kind of environment comes from the Sotweed Factor, which is a, a poem from 1708. And it is a satire, but I'm fairly certain that this description of people coming into town to do their business is fairly accurate, um, where he says, you know, dismounting steed with friendly guide, our horses to a tree we tied. So if everybody's coming to St. Mary's to go to court, the assembly, the government, all the people staying at the ordinary, all the people who are being sued, all the people who are suing other people, um, and they're all on horseback, where are all those horses going? So this is one of my big questions for the St. Mary's research. Um, and I believe what's happening is that people are either riding to the ordinary they're going to stay at, maybe they tie the horse to the fence briefly and whoever's at the ordinary working, a servant, a slave, whatever, is going to then take that horse somewhere where it can sort of forage and roam. Maybe they have an agreement with a plantation on the outskirts or something where they put them. Or maybe they're just tying them to a tree kind of to keep them away from the other horses if they're just coming in for a day kind of thing. Um, and so there would have been a lot of them here, but not necessarily living here. So when I'm thinking about the artifacts for St. Mary's, and I totally copied this awesome interactive map from your website, it's great. Um, <laughs> I, I was thinking about the different ways that, that we, the horse-related artifacts would reflect this sort of intermittent population boom in a town, a city like St. Mary's. Um, so if you're a permanent resident, you're going to have bridles, saddles, and horses in residence. Um, saddles, by the way, are generally kept in your house. They're like a piece of furniture, so you don't want to just like leave it out in the shed, especially in the Chesapeake where it may grow mold. Um, so in probate inventories, we see them in chambers and bed chambers and halls and things like that. So you're going to see them in domestic spaces. Um, the horses, they're going to live somewhere, whether it's in the townland or um, not necessarily fenced in in a pasture because it was more typical to actually build fences around your crops to keep the livestock out. Um, but I'm not really sure if that was different in town. Maybe it had to be sort of a flipped kind of thing where you had your fences to keep the livestock in instead of out. I don't really know. Um, but you would have had all of those for the permanent residents. Then when no, people are coming in to stay at an ordinary overnight, the bridles would have been there for sure. 
Maybe the saddles were coming off the horse at the ordinary. I don't really know. Maybe they were taking them somewhere else and then taking the saddle off and storing it. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and then the horses would have been there temporarily, either in town or, like I said, somewhere on the outskirts. And then if you're a day tripper, you would definitely have bridles, but you probably wouldn't bother to take the saddle off and the horses wouldn't stay. So now we need to talk about what those horses are wearing, what to wear when you go to town and you're riding a horse. Um, and this was a whole different aspect of research. So there's all this historical background and context. Um, but this part of the research really focused on who made these artifacts, where were they made, how were they traded, um, because that impacts how we interpret them. Um, think about a saddle as a piece of furniture with lots of different components. Um, and in the 17th century, the metal components were being made by a trade called the Loriner. This is a word that didn't even make it to the New World because Loriners didn't ever really come to the New World as, as part of the colonial venture. You didn't start getting manufacture of the metal parts of horse-related things in the U.S. until the Industrial Revolution was making them. So all the way up through the colonial period, after the revolution even, the trade people are like, we have to start trading with England again because we need their stuff to make our horses, our, our saddles and horse furniture. Um, so the metal parts are being made in England. Um, and then you have other components of horses, horse furniture. The wooden saddle tree that is the base is usually made by a joiner or a special saddle tree maker. So it's more of a carpentry thing. Um, the upholstery, the cloth, all of the stuffing and everything that goes into it is being made by, by people in that trade. Upholstery, cloth, etc. Leather is being made by tanners. And all of those people are feeding their materials to saddlers who just do assembly. So the saddlers aren't making all of the component goods. They're just assembling it into the saddle. Um, and in the meantime, blacksmiths are doing farriery and horseshoes, which we don't really have here. They're not making all that metal stuff that goes into the saddle. So if you think you can just go to your local blacksmith and get one of these curb bits made, that wasn't really a thing. So it turns out that Lorners were making this stuff. And in Maryland and Virginia, they were importing whole bridles and saddles. But in other areas where you had other colonial areas like Pennsylvania, where you had a lot of tradespeople, there were a lot of saddlers in like Philadelphia, for example, they were importing just those metal bits, the bits, the stirrups, et cetera, the snaffles, the spurs, and then those would go to the saddler shop, the saddler would do the assemblage and, and they would sell them. And in Maryland and Virginia, that was not the case. So these are graphs. I don't love to use graphs in presentations, but they're, they're very striking to me. I looked at the customs records for England from 1690 to 1770, and I looked at all the horse-related stuff in them, whether it was foreign manufacture, English manufacture, where it was being sent to the Caribbean, to, to the tobacco colonies, to Pennsylvania, or like all of it at 10-year intervals. Um, and when I mapped it, Maryland and Virginia are importing saddles and bridles, completed ones, by the thousands. Like in 1720 alone, it was like 24,000 bridles imported that year, according to the English customs. Um, and even once the other plantation colonies started to get settled and those started creeping up, Maryland and Virginia were still like way up there. So they're not really being made here. They're being imported. They're coming in off the ship. Uh, and what that tells us is that not only were there, you know, in the tobacco culture, people were concentrating on their, their cash crop, not necessarily on making things, and this is a, a very common theme um, in Maryland and Virginia, but also everybody must have had a horse or you wouldn't have needed this much stuff. It's a lot. Um, and that means there's a reason I found so much horse-related stuff when I was going through all of our collections. So when I go to interpret those collections, I want to know things like, okay, well, did people have a super high-end saddle or a low-end saddle? What can I say about the status of this person? How, was this an expensive one or a not expensive one? And, and how can I tell that? I know that it's all being made in England and it's all being bought off the boat. Where do I go from there? So I looked at some ships' bills of lading and, and how the merchants were dealing with this. And um, 
what the merchants were doing is they would go to one saddler um, in London, for example, and buy in bulk 12 hunting saddles, um, no further description, and they would come over in a hogshead. Um, and then in one case, but not in all the cases, so like I saw this, you know, saddles in bulk, 12 hunting saddles, six hunting saddles, et cetera. I saw that several times, but in one case, they went to a separate saddler and bought very specialized saddles, hunting saddles with plush seats, trimmed with silver and all furniture, um, side saddles, green and crimson coffoy. Um, and so you could get specialized saddles here and you did. Um, and when you hear terms like plush and silver, that means velvet with literally metal embroidery, like silver thread, like silk thread wrapped in silver and embroidered and tasseled on the saddle. That was here. Um, where you needed to take that to show off like how awesome you are, I don't know. Um, but they had them. And uh, we do find metallic threads in our assemblages. Unfortunately for archaeologists, what made one saddle more expensive than another wasn't the special bridle and it wasn't um, the metal. It was the upholstery. We don't find the upholstery. So everybody's metal bits on their bridles and saddles, all the same. Mass produced by the learners, shipped to the saddlers. And if the saddler was making you a fancy saddle, it went into the velvet and the embroidery. And we're not going to find it. Sad. So now we know where all this stuff is coming from. How do we actually recognize it accurately? Um, and this is... If anything is my superpower, this is it. Um, it is the one superpower that I have, so I have to like use it when I can. So if you have little metal things, send them to me because it makes me feel important. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I had to do was learn the anatomy of a saddle. I don't ride, I don't know anything about this stuff. Um, but obviously saddles were here, um, so why aren't we recognizing them? So it turns out a saddle is, is the base is a saddle tree. In this time period, it's made of beech wood. Um, the saddle tree is fairly flin, thin to be flexible as you're riding so as not to hurt the horse and everything. Um, and because they're fairly thin, one of the things they have on them to reinforce them is uh, an, a metal bracket called a gullet. Um, and we do find these archaeologically, and they're always always cataloged wrong unless they're completely whole and you happen to randomly have a horse person cataloging that day. Um, so uh, I, what I've done here is I've given this talk several times. I've tried to replace as many of my usual photos as I can with St. Mary's City artifacts. So when you see all these site numbers on here, that's for all of the staff here at HSMC. So they can be like, oh, I didn't know we had a blah, blah from Anne Arundel Hall. Um, and now you'll know. So these are all gullets from St. Mary's City. Uh, they all represent saddles. Most are from the John Hicks site, which is not particularly surprising because that's an 18th century site. And by then, everybody had horses. And at John Hicks, there were a lot of them. Um, there is one from Town Center. I can't date that saddle gullet for you to tell you if it's Broom Howard period or Town Center period. Again, sad. Uh, it would be great if we could. But you have these here. They always get cataloged as trunk parts, hinges, unidentified hardware, and they often don't get conserved, uh, which is also a bummer because then we're not recognizing them. Um, you guys don't have, as far as I'm aware, but we do have, and I have one up here, side saddle gullets. You can recognize the side saddle by the shapes of the gullets that you find. This one that's complete over here is from Colonial Williamsburg, um, and then the other one is sort of the the like surround part that's from one of our collections at the Mac Lab. Another saddle part that is often miscatalogued, although sometimes included as harness, um, is called a civet. So this is, it, it's often called a buckle. It's like an iron buckle frame. It hangs from an iron um, bracket essentially that attaches to the sides of the saddle tree. From that civet, the straps are attached that the the girth strap, which goes under the belly of the horse to hold the saddle on, those will strap, buckle to the straps that hang from the civets. So when you see this kind of buckle, and these are all St. Mary's examples, um, you know you have a saddle. It's not, I have harness, it's I have a saddle. Um, and it's a little bit different. 
Stirrup bars are another piece of saddles that are often misidentified, uh, but they have a very distinctive L shape with a circular cross section because this is the bar that the stirrup leathers hang from. So if you're putting your, the weight of your body on the stirrup and the leather strap is hanging from this bar, if it wasn't rounded, you would break those stirrup leathers on a regular basis. So you look for, as an archeologist, you look for the rounded cross section in the middle, this L shape with these sort of paddle ends to attach it. Um, and there were some in the John Hicks collection and one from Anne Arundel Hall. Um, and I have several up here in case anybody wants a closer look. Again, often very fragmentary because they're iron and they often don't get conserved. So speaking of stirrups, we do find a lot of stirrups and these do tend to get recognized unless they're very fragmentary. Um, so they're not super compelling. They don't change a lot over time. Um, and while they are already on our website, I think most people are already getting these when they're looking at their archeological collections. Um, but one thing that you guys have that's very cool that most people are not recognizing is a pommel, a metal pommel. Um, and this one in the middle is from the Van Swearingen site. The rest are from um, either CW or our collections. So the metal pommel goes on this very distinct style of saddle uh, that is a very specific type that is only used for a certain time period. So in the 17th century, when you still have this medieval kind of jousting influence to your saddles, you have this metal pommel. Um, but by the 1630s, they got rid of that metal pommel, as you can see in this one over here. This is a seven, I'm sorry, 1730s. So this is a 1730s source, um, and there's no metal pommel there, but there is on this one. Um, and what this source says is that here are four types of saddles. This is sort of your Vassel à Royale. Most of these sources were in French, so it was a really good thing the pandemic happened because I was entering things in Google Translate a lot. Um, the Cella Royale is like your sedan. It's comfy. You can hang all your stuff from it, like your pistol holsters in case of bandits. Um, and it sort of encloses you, but not too terribly much. So it's, it's like your basic saddle. Um, what's happening in this time period is people are more into hunting and jumping in a different kind of way, and they're moving away from this medieval style saddle. That's where the English saddle comes in. We call it English saddle basically the same as today, they called it hunting saddle because it allows you freedom of movement for jumping. And this, which has the metal pommel on it, is a training saddle. It has these super high battens to sort of keep you in the saddle in case the horse is trying to throw you. And what this source says is that the metal pommel goes out of favor on everything except for the training saddle because people were sort of getting thrown a little bit and jostled and kind of landing on them badly and getting hurt. Um, so if you can imagine, your horse jumps a little too high and you go a little too far front. Like, so they were like, well, let's stop using those. This is awesome for archeologists. It gives us what's called a TPQ. So we know no more pommels after this period unless it's on a training saddle. So if we go back to my slide here, at our site, the ones on the bottom, I'm pretty sure these are training saddles. It tells us about what they're doing at the site. For yours, the Van Swearingen one, my guess is that it's a time thing. I think it's probably just really early when that was the style. Also, it's silver plated, which is kind of a big deal. Anyway, um, how to recognize an English saddle in our collections. Um, there's this very distinctive artifact, always cataloged as a button. But it is, I believe, in fact, a saddle nail. Um, there's great sources that talk about these English nails um, that sort of go four per English saddle. Um, and the way you can tell the difference between these and a button is that they're, they're always over an inch wide. They tend to be a little bit taller, a little bit more robust than a button. And instead of a loop shank on the back for sewing, they have a nail shaft in the back to be nailed into the saddle tree from the outside of the upholstery. Um, and so these, I think, are fantastic um, for learning where people are getting on and off their horses, because uh, you can imagine as you're getting on and off your horse, these fall off, <laughs> and they're all broken. I, I haven't found a whole one ever. Um, so they fall off, and they sort of show you where people are getting on and off. So they're, they're, they really speak to the mobility of people on their horses. 
All right, so into bits a little bit. There's Snapple bits, which is a fairly plain type of bit. And this right here is a trade card that sort of shows the standard kinds of stuff that we have in most of our collections. So Snaffle bits are one type. When you pull on a Snaffle bit, the connection of the reins is right here, so it sort of makes the horse's head go up. As opposed to a curb bit, which was the most popular in this time period, where the reins attach down at the bottom here, and they act as a lever on a chain that goes under the horse's chin, and when you pull on those, it makes the horse's head go down. That was what was most popular in the 17th century. This is the kind of curb bit that we get a lot. We have all the leather ornaments, all the cheek bosses, all the buckles, so many pieces of these, and the chains. And so recognizing those is, is very helpful for understanding what things are for. So here's a bunch, here's a curb chain, just a beautiful curb chain from St. John's. Um, I don't know if it was cataloged as a curb chain, um, but it may have been cataloged as hardware, it depends. Um, this was an unidentified curb bit from the Hicks site. Um, this is another St. John's bit, but I think most people would recognize that as a bit, and it might even be in one of the exhibits, I'm not sure. Anyway. Um, so yeah, so there's lots of components to these. We find lots of elements of them, mostly in tiny little fragments, and so it can be hard to identify them. Um, but the best thing about curb bits is they have all this ornamentation, and the ornamentation changes over time. So we can finally get into this last section, which is interpreting artifacts in context to better understand sites and colonial life. So I mentioned that the fancier stuff is going to be in the upholstery, not the metals. Um, it turns out there are fancier ornaments and plainer ornaments, but they tell time. It doesn't have anything to do with how expensive they were. So the earlier cheek bosses and ornaments for bridles are fancier. And you guys have a lot of fancy ornaments in the historic St. Mary City collections, and that is not a surprise. The later ones tend to get simpler. And these are just some, some decorative arts changes when you go from Baroque style to Queen Anne, William and Mary, you know, it, things were getting simpler. Um, so these are more 18th century styles. These are also present in the St. Mary's collections because as we know, people continue to live here. Um, but it doesn't really have anything to do with status or anything like that. Um, but some of the things as, I, I can't interpret all of St. Mary's city collections. I have no idea what portion of the horse related stuff I was able to access. I only had one week there and there's what, 5,000 boxes ish. Uh, I don't know. So I don't really know what kind of sample I got in all honesty. Um, but these guys were so helpful and the conservators were bringing me things that they had in treatment. They were like, oh, isn't this that? And it was fantastic. Um, this is some of the leather ornaments, not even all of them. There are tons of these in St. Mary's. And this makes so much sense because everybody's bringing their horses in, they're tying them to a tree or a fence, and then they're going and carousing and having fun. Those horses are gonna be fidgeting and rubbing and like those bridles are gonna be shedding those leather ornaments ornaments all over. So if you could map the leather ornaments in a layer and a like a GIS map with fence lines and tree root disturbances, I bet you would see a correlation of those things. Um, Augie says that'll take 10 years, <laughs> which is fair. It would take a lot. Um, you also, to a lesser extent, I think would see broken bits of those bosses um, and bits and everything in those same areas. And you would also find those English saddle nails where people are getting on and off their horses. And things I didn't really talk about a lot, but, but is part of this interpretive thing, um, is that horseshoes, when you do find them in context, now that we know this background history, um, it's usually because they're nailed in doorways or at fireplaces to ward off witches. The horseshoe has been a lucky thing used to uh, be like an anti-curse device for hundreds of years. We have documentation of it in Virginia very early that, oh, this guy accused this woman of being a witch, but then she passed through his door and it had a horseshoe on it. So he was like, okay, I take it back. Um, and so we know that was happening. And so the few horseshoes we have at St. Mary's City that have these really old characteristics um, probably are clustering in domestic spaces. And, um, and then you know that they're being used for what we like to use, call them as apotropaic purposes, um, meaning magic. Um, and spurs, there's so many spurs at St. Mary's City, uh, but it turns out that the spurs 
didn't really have a whole lot to do with horses here. It's just that in the early 17th century, all the way up to about 1670 or so, men just wore spurs. Boots and spurs, it was the thing. It was what you wore. And they were big and they were showy and it was an accessory and it had nothing to do with whether you had a horse or whether you rode. Uh, so some of the best earliest spurs we have in Maryland are from the collections here at St. Mary's. All right, so that's just a few of the interpretive things that you can do um, with these horse-related artifacts, but I think I managed to do okay uh, to move on to the Q&A. Um, Peter, do, I, do you have my... I, and I also wanted everybody to know that I brought a bunch of artifacts, both from the collections at the Mac Lab, and then I met with the St. Mary's folks, and we brought some stuff from here. Um, in case you want a closer look, it is sad that a lot of these um, horse-related artifacts are iron. They get super rusty. They're not beautiful, except for the ornaments. They're all very pretty. Uh, <laughs> but it, I, if you are, do archaeology at all or you want to recognize them, there is no substitute for actually, like, looking at them very closely. And if it's my stuff and it's in a bag, I'll even let you pick up the bag and get a closer look. So, yeah, any questions? Wow. Hello? Is there any of like buckles for horse furniture versus like personal buckles that would help us identify the layout? Yes. Um, and in fact, uh, I, I can send you through through Augie and Aaron a link, um, but I did uh, as part of this research. So I had to leave buckles out because they're complicated because people wear them and horses wear them. Um, but I was hoping as part of this grant that I would figure that out and I did and I was so excited. Um, so basically when people are wearing buckles, um, you can look at the front and the back. They're usually cast copper alloy. And so when you look at the back, it's gonna be sort of polished and finished. They're gonna be curved to go towards the body. And they're usually made in two pieces with a pin in the middle. Whereas the ones that are used on horse tack, they still have that bumpy cast back. They're made in one piece and they're flat. So anyway, there is a PowerPoint that I did for an SHA presentation. It's 15 minutes long and it's on YouTube and you can watch it and, I, and you will be able to say, this is probably horse and this is probably people and be fairly confident about it. Thanks so much, Sam. Awesome. Um, you had a really dumb graph early showing that there Crazy difference between prizes and saddles being imported for the state of Virginia. Did you get a sense of differences in horse population between Maryland and Virginia versus other colony? Would a is the horse is a totally Maryland Virginia thing and less so elsewhere? Would that contribute? Well, I I didn't do research into horse populations in other colonies so much. Um, and part of the problem with looking at the other colonies is that I can't measure how many saddles and bridles they have because when they in the customs records, when you import iron goods, it's taken by weight. And so it's like this much wrought iron. And so all of that is masked in the customs records. If it's made into a saddle or a bridle, then I can count it. So I don't know how many they really had there because they're just importing the metal by weight. Um, but I do think um, I do think there's a compelling argument to be made that in areas where you have um, more central town settlements and you know the traditional urban centers and you know things that aren't sort of uniquely tobacco culture Maryland, that they also are using maybe more vehicles, certainly more oxen to pull things. You know, I, I think that it really was a very distinctive Chesapeake horse culture. You know, it still lives to this day um, that there is a distinctive Chesapeake horse culture. And, and so I think there were also just more horses here. I really do. But I haven't looked at the other colonies to prove it. Jessica. Um, so I was looking at the like, horse furniture, the, um, the canoe pieces, where you have like, the earlier stuff that's very like, molded. Mm -hmm. Later stuff, I know that some of the things that we found before were similar type 
have more incised design kind of edge to them. Is there like a transition between them or is it almost like immediately that changes? It's, it's pretty gradual. Um, I cut a few slides for this version of this talk. Um, and one of the things I, I took out was the intermittent version of boss, where you go from this molded boss to what I call, um, what somebody sort of tongue in cheek called mammiform. You know, it's, it's got a nipple. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no way around it. Like that's, that's the only way to describe it. Um, and that seems to be the transitional um, like boss. And there is this period where you get sort of just plain circles that have more like, like you said, incised stuff on it, um, as opposed to molding. Um, but again, those decorative ones tend to be fairly early. Um, the ones that I showed you are more like after 1720 or so. Um, and one of the things that's happening and that's driving that in that I, I didn't get into a lot in this talk is that there's an obsession in England that also translates here to an extent about breeding and thoroughbreds and the bloodlines being introduced in terms of horses at the time. And so you go from having this, um, this trend towards really dressing up the horse and the velvet and the tassels and like all the things um, to your portrait of your horse is being taken with just a plain snaffle and a groom in front and it's just showing the physique of the horse. And so you really get the simplification of all of the horse related furniture that goes along with that trend too. Um, and so there's a decorative arts push to simplification and then also this sort of like, we don't wanna mar the, the breed and the beautiful lines of the horse with anything extra. So there's two factors that really push that. So generally speaking, when you find something decorated, whether it's incised or molded, it tends to be earlier, but it's not like psh, all of a sudden it changes. Um, I will say though, um, because these things are being mass produced and shipped by the thousands, they are like, you see these styles everywhere. So you guys have some styles I haven't really seen in other places. The one that's shaped like a bone and has little inside lines on it. I'm pretty sure that must be one of the relatively early ones because I haven't seen that other places in Maryland. But almost all the other styles you have, you have them on all the other sites. Like you can take that arrow shaped leather ornament and any colonial site in Maryland after 1680 and before 1730, you're going to find that leather ornament. It's almost inevitable. Yeah. Um, there in your uh, and your spike of uh, the graph, the dramatic spike in 1720 for the, in the park. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um, if I had an infinite amount of time, instead of doing 10 year intervals in the customs records, I would do like all 70 years of the customs records to see if there's trends in what's happening, because that really was an anomalous spike. Um, but I do think we see it reflected in the artifacts too, um, because when we sort of know based on ceramics and ceramic style changes when sites are occupied, and, and I think that we see sort of these same styles all of a sudden, you know, well, not all of a sudden, sudden, but like, you know, you see the same ones showing up across sites and it, it makes sense. If you have 20,000 bridles coming in in one year, uh, those are, have to go somewhere and then we're gonna end up finding them. Um, and, and so if that many are coming over and they're all made in the same year, they're gonna be similar styles and there's a reason we see these same things occurring on multiple sites. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know, maybe there was some big event. Yeah, I wish I knew. If any of you figure it out, let me know. <sighs> <laughs> there was one more question, but that's cool. <laughs> Actually, we got an important number of horses introduced here. Were also the horses simply bred here? Yes. Um, in a fairly quick succession, succession, you get um, laws in Maryland saying um, you can't export horses because they're they're rare. To you have to make sure your fence is this high to keep the horse out. Um, of your crops. So people were so there were so many horses that people were complaining that their crops were getting eaten by their neighbor's horse, right? So you get these laws saying your fence has to be this high. And if it is this high and your neighbor's horse eats your crops and you report it and it still keeps happening, then you have the right to destroy that horse. Like there's all these laws about it. 
Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. So you go from you can't export them, you know, we need this many horses to, okay, now we have to build fences because we have too many roaming horses. And then the laws almost like within a decade are like, we can't import horses anymore. Um, it, it go, it's, it's pretty quick transition. But if you think about it, it's because they're all free roaming in the woods, right? And so, um, you know, based on what I read, if you leave horses to their own devices, a mare can have a colt about once a year. And so if they're all roaming in the woods and they're not geldings and you have the stone horses, the stallions and the mares, and they're all kind of out and about, um, then they're just going to be naturally breeding. And so every mare might be having a coal every year. And so the population is, is going to grow pretty fast. And there was even one proposed law in the Maryland Assembly that was particularly interesting because um, this obsession with the breeds and the, the, the bloodstock of the horses was, was part of the English culture. And people were very worried in Maryland that the horses were getting shorter that they weren't controlling breeding enough, that they were just letting them roam around and they weren't controlling breeding and they didn't really like uh, the results of that. Um, and so they tried to pass a law um, limiting the number of stone horses to very specific people at specific places. So where maybe you had one at St. Mary's and somebody's stallion had to be the sire that you would bring your mare to and whatever. Um, and as far as I can tell from reading the archives of Maryland, it just died because like either the upper or the lower assembly or whatever was like, you're never going to get people to give up their stallions. Like you cannot tell people they're not allowed to have one that's like not on because by then everybody was taking care of their own stuff. Um, so, so yeah, I think that answered your question. I might have gone way, way off topic. <laughs> and an aside, do you have any insight into the origin of the horses? Oh, are you talking about the ones that they just, they think they have like some Spanish DNA and things like that? Yeah. No, I have not looked into sort of the natural history, DNA, like lineages and things like that to do with horses. So I came at this strictly from a material culture standpoint from the artifacts. Um, but I have been in some sessions with people that were looking at sort of how horses spread throughout the colonies and things like that and the people who are doing that kind of research. Uh, there's a really great group um, called the Equine History Collective that really loves to nerd out over that kind of thing. And it may well be that some of the Spanish horses like ended up up there but all of the historic records we have for the the founding of the colonies basically say there were no horses here they couldn't get them they didn't have them um, so even if you had some spanish horse stock ending up on the eastern shore it's pretty clear that the people moving into saint mary's didn't know about it or they would have been on top of that <laughs> all right talk about the difference between you know the spanish culture western the yeah Sort of a little bit of influence in French. What about Dutch? Yeah, so I don't know. Um, it would be lovely if I could say, oh, this is a Dutch bridle. This was probably smuggled. I, I can't do that. <laughs> I have seen references in records to Dutch bridles. I don't know what that means. Um, this is a this is a shortcoming of the documentation. There's a surprising amount of documentation of horsemanship and, and some material culture in the 17th century, even in the, the 16th century, especially making the Germans, like as a hobby, made bit books, books of like different styles of bits, um, hundreds of pages like mermaids and fish and all the crazy shapes. Um, and so there was that to look at. And there was then French 18th century encyclopedia, like, like, craze that I could go through, but there really wasn't anything that was like, this is the 17th century in England or the Netherlands um, to go through. So I don't know how they were defining a Dutch Dutch bridal. Um, clearly they could recognize that, whether I could point at one of these and say that's what that is, not yet. Um, but I have managed to do that with certain things. So there, there's hope. I may get there someday, but not yet. Anything else? All right. Does anybody want to see the stuff? <laughs>